success last year. Um, we had some surprising success last year um, with uh, the performance of the system on uh, science exams. So what I'm going to do here is to give an overview of the system and also dig into uh, some of the details about what works and what doesn't work inside us and particularly address the question about whether it's just uh, doing fancy pan matching or is there something a bit more intelligent going on in the middle. Um, before that, just for those of you who uh, don't know, um, the Allen Institute in non-COVID times uh, is a uh, populated office here shown with the arrow. So we're in Seattle, we have this uh, beautiful view, at least in the summer, onto downtown, uh, the downtown area. Um, so if you're ever up in Seattle, please come and visit. Um, now with COVID, my office has uh, changed to this. So this is uh, typically where I hang out. I'm actually downstairs uh, at the moment. This is one of our dogs, Dobby, who keeps me company. She's uh, uh, overjoyed at having eight hours of attention every day now because I'm at home. Um, and I always used to wonder what these dogs did while I was uh, at work all day. And now because I'm at home, I get to see, you know, do they run around and bark all the time or whatever? Uh, turns out um, what they do is they sleep and they sleep and they sleep and they sleep and they sleep. So as you can see, a dog's life is uh, not that bad, at least uh, in this household. Uh, so that's a quick glimpse of my, uh, of my home life. So um, the Aristo project started with uh, impetus from uh, the late Paul Allen, who was a, uh, uh, he had a passion for AI and he really wanted to see AI in his lifetime. Um, in his book, The Ideas Man, uh, The Idea Man, he writes, uh, over the last decade, I began to think about a digital Aristotle, an easy to use, all encompassing knowledge storehouse to advance the field of AI. Uh, and I think his picture of an AI system was one where you could sit down and have a conversation with it about uh, cell biology or something like that. Uh, and so the Aristo project was born out of this vision, uh, Aristo connoting Aristotle as a child. Uh, and to make it operational, we uh, focused on science to narrow down the scope. Uh, and also we started at fourth and um, eighth grade science levels. Um, and you might wonder, you know, why science questions? Well, um, if you uh, look at, uh, take even a cursory look at science exams, you'll realize these questions are really uh, hard and challenging. So here's just an example to illustrate this. Uh, so the question here says, how are the particles in a block of iron affected when uh, the block is melted? The correct answer is the particles move more rapidly. Um, and to answer this requires both science knowledge, you need to know that high temperatures cause uh, particles to move more quickly. And also there's some common sense knowledge, you need to know if you melt something then its temperature must have gone up. Uh, and then of course you need the reasoning capabilities to, uh, to mix all that together. Um, so uh, we've em embarked on studying science um, and you can ask as well, you know, why science tests? Um, our, our mission isn't to put fourth graders out of work and actually our goal isn't really to pass science tests. We just use that as a metric for how well we're doing. Really science questions are a microcosm for many general phenomena in AI that uh, we care about. Um, so answering science questions requires a significant amount of reasoning. Um, there's a huge diversity in, in styles of questions to answer, and they typically require a lot of common sense and world knowledge to answer. And then at the same time, just from a practical point of view, um, measuring performance on science tests is uh, easy to measure. Um, it's graduated. Um, it's not a gameable, uh, uh, um, it's not particularly gameable in terms of solving with cheap tricks. It's ambitious and it's motivating. So these are all um, desirable qualities of a, a project to work on. And if you go through and um, uh, assess the um, performance of a science exam against these goals, it, um, the science exams pretty much have all these qualities. So we have, um, we started in 2014 um, and we had a 
a set of uh, hidden eighth grade science exams that we uh, used to test the system. And most of our work has been performed on the non-diagram multiple choice parts of the exam. First of all, these are the most prevalent types of questions in science exams. Uh, and secondly, um, we decided to avoid dealing with diagrams because they raise a whole host of separate super challenging problems that are somewhat orthogonal to the reasoning issues we were interested in. So all these numbers I'm going to show you are based on the non-diagram multiple choice subset. When we started, the, the, the first version of Aristo scored about 36%. These are four-way multiple choice, so baseline is about 25%. And then we added in some basic retrieval methods. We had some rule-based rule systems. I'll mention those in a second. Our scores went up to about 63%. And then at that point, we um, launched the Allen AI Science Challenge. So we threw this open to the uh, community. Uh, we released several thousand eighth grade science, multiple choice science questions and asked if, uh, asked, invited other people to have a go at building a system that could answer these. And um, there was very strong uptake on this challenge. We had um, about 3,000 downloads of the, uh, of, of the data set. Uh, we had 750 submissions uh, in the actual competition. But even then, at the end of the day, um, the best system, the, the, the winner scored just under 60% on these questions. And this led to uh, this article appearing in the business magazine saying, the best AI still flunks eighth grade science uh, reporting on that competition. And I think that reflects just on how challenging many of these science questions are to, to answer. So we uh, continued, we added in some uh, additional reasoning methods. And of course, the huge change, which has happened in the last uh, year and a half to two years, has been the advent of uh, large scale language models. And adding those into Aristo has caused this big boost in scores up to the 90% uh, level, which is really quite remarkable, particularly given that as, you, as your scores get higher, it gets harder and harder to eke out extra gains. And this huge boost is really uh, quite stunning to me, having looked at these questions for a long time, and I think reflects the the, the huge progress in the field uh, as a whole in natural language. Um, we've seen this progress in fourth and twelfth grade science as well, and we um, we also tested Aristo on the latest three exams that weren't, weren't part of the original test set, uh, and Aristo scored uh, ninety three percent on average on those questions. So this isn't uh, just a statistical fluke here. So um, uh, the, what I want to delve into now is just what's going on inside Aristo, how does it uh, uh, work and uh, what's responsible for these, uh, these high scores that seem to be uh, appearing. So Aristo is an um, ensemble of solvers. This is an um, oversimplified architecture of the uh, system. So there are eight different solvers that independently try to answer the questions. Um, they're loosely divided up into three families. There's the retrieval and statistics solvers, the inference solvers, and the language models. Um, I won't say much about the retrieval and statistics solvers. Uh, essentially, the retrieval solver takes a question and looks in a large corpus to see if the answer is written down somewhere, so using basic IR techniques. Uh, the statistical solvers um, try to see if there are statistical correlations between um, words in the question and words in the answer option and use that as a rather weak signal of which answer option might be uh, uh, appropriate. Um, we have three uh, inference solvers that attempt to reason with semi-structured knowledge to answer these questions. Um, and these are uh, a bit more interesting in terms of their behavior. I'm just going to mention one of these, which is called um, tuple inference. Uh, so th the idea with tuple inference is to create a a uh, large knowledge base of um, semi-structured facts extracted from our large text corpus. So these are facts stored in uh, triples and sometimes four tuples that are meant to encode the basic uh, elements of knowledge that are described in text. And then this solver tries to bring those to bear on a particular question. So uh, this particular example here reads, which objects in our solar system reflects light and is a satellite that orbits around one planet? Uh, the correct answer here is uh, the moon. 
um, and uh, um, when the, the, the way this solver works is first of all to retrieve a set of tuples that seem relevant. Uh, so here's some of the tuples that would be uh, retrieved. And then there's an alignment algorithm that tries to create a, a support graph which aligns the tuples that have been retrieved with the uh, statements uh, in the question and the answer options. So what I'm showing here is the support graph uh, that supports the, the first answer option A. And we use integer linear programming to try to search for the optimal support graph for each of the answer options and then to score those support graphs. And then the answer option with the best support graph is selected. And some of the constraints that the ILP system uses includes things like um, cover as many of the question words as possible, uh, at least one of the answer option words should be mentioned, one of the tuples and so on. So the, um, the intuition here is that sentences in a general corpus contain a large number of intermingled facts, often in the same sentence. If we can isolate these into the, the, the basic atomic bits of knowledge, this might prove a uh, more effective way of answering questions. And I'm, I mentioned the performance of the tuple system uh, in just a second. And then let me turn to the language models, which um, now do most of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, answering these questions. Uh, so the basic architecture is, has become more standard now. So what we do is we take a question and an answer option. There's an information retrieval step which retrieves 20 sentences from Aristo's text corpus, which is about a third of a terabyte of text. And then this is fed into BERT or Roberta. Um, you could think of BERT as essentially trying to read this retrieved text and decide whether this particular answer option is correct. And what we do is we project the CLS token to a single logit to assign a competence to this answer option. We do the same for the, different, for the four different options, run it through a softmax and pick the most uh, probable uh, answer option. Um, and there's just a question which somebody typed in. So let me just uh, read this out. Um, does tuple inference take into account which paths in the graph make most sense? Or is it susceptible to confounders with several irrelevant links uh, to the question? Um, so that's, uh, that's a good question. So the system does try to take into account um, well, does it have a notion of what makes most sense? It has a notion of confidence in, uh, in the links uh, of which it's trained to recognize. And so uh, the links are scored with different weights. Uh, I guess a notion of making most sense would be one where there are multiple connections between a tuple and the question. And yes, it will uh, give higher weight to those things. Um, it is susceptible to co-founders though, so sometimes uh, that's, uh, th there are sometimes ways of connecting a tuple to a random bits of the question, and so that might confound it. Um, there are biases, for instance, in that tuple inference solver where um, if the words in the question and the words in the tuple appear in the same order, then that tuple is preferred and so on. So there's some degree of, there's some degree of, uh, uh, attempts to uh, control the, the, the tuple connections to the, uh, to, to the question. So let me just talk now, just going back to language models and ask about how, uh, how do the language models impact uh, the performance of Aristo? So this was the performance of Aristo in 2000, the early 2019. It was about 73% on our challenge set. Uh, we added in a uh, textual entailment solver called Multi, uh, and that boosted Aristo solver up to 79%. When we add in BERT, which is uh, and just training it on the science questions without any information retrieval step, it does well. It scores about 67%, um, but it's not uh, dramatically high. Uh, and so we did three things to try and improve its performance. Uh, the first was including this uh, IR step, so it's given background knowledge. Uh, the second, uh, we found that training the system with a uh, multi-step curriculum really improved performance. So the way we train BERT is first of all training it on general multiple choice questions using the race data set. Uh, then, then we train it on general science questions, um, 
which includes not just the regents questions which are our targets but other science questions and then we fine-tune this even further using the regents uh, science questions which are our targets and this makes a big difference and then thirdly we ensemble three different versions of BERT together we use BERT cased and uncased and use two different training regimens and all that together we call Aristo BERT and that's on its own remarkably scores about 80, 83% on the science questions. Folding it into Aristo, the scores go up to 87%. Uh, we do the same, but now using Roberta, which is uh, an even better uh, uh, pre-trained uh, uh, version of BERT. And adding that in, we end up with the scores of 91.6. Uh, and as you can see, again, the language models are doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Um, I mentioned this is the curve for fourth grade science, we see the same thing, and remarkably for 12th grade science, we see a similar uh, increase and the scores go up to amazingly 83% for, um, for, eighth, uh, for 12th grade science. And these, are, these are pretty difficult questions, questions I sometimes uh, am struggling to, uh, to answer myself. Uh, this shows the performance of individual solvers on five different data sets, so we have fourth, eighth, and 12th grade questions and uh, our large compendium of questions, the easy and challenge data sets. I'm just gonna zoom in on the eighth grade questions. I just want to highlight these two blue bars here. Uh, the first corresponds to Aristo Burt and the, the other one Aristo Roberta. And as you can see, the language models are doing most of the heavy lifting. And this raises some really interesting questions. Um, uh, as I hinted at the beginning, are these language models just doing really fancy pattern matching? Uh, maybe the science questions, particularly the multiple choice questions, aren't as difficult as we thought? Um, or is there something uh, more going on inside? Are there some, is there some evidence of uh, reasoning or some semantics inside? Um, so this calls for some detective work, which I'm going to delve into a little bit to, to look into this. So what's going on behind the high scores on the exams? Uh, so we've done a bunch of investigations to, to try and tease apart, you know, why the system suddenly is doing so well. Um, the first uh, test we did is to look for annotation artifacts. So it's now well known that uh, neural systems can pick up on uh, uh, subtle giveaways in uh, tests, which may be totally unrelated to the task that we're trying to address. Uh, so one of the most common test is, um, can the system answer the question just given the answer options, but not actually given the question body? So of course, no, no, no reasonable system should be able to do well on this. Um, it's been found in other data sets that actually systems can sometimes pick up on cues in the answer options to find the right one, uh, particularly on crowdsourced data sets where Turkers, for instance, sometimes get lazy and uh, repeat the same incorrect answer options, which can be a giveaway. When we do this, when we train and test Aristo on these answer only data sets, we find Aristo scores desirably remain pretty low. So uh, this scores about 37% on the compendium of questions we have. Um, so this is slightly better than chance, which would be 25%, but still way below the 90% scores that we were seeing with the Regents exams. And so this is actually good news. Um, it suggests that at least for carefully curated human authored exams, um, it's, um, th there aren't kind of obvious giveaways in the uh, answer style or the answer wording that gives away the right answers. Um, a second test we did is whether, is whether we can fool the system by obvious, adding some obviously wrong answers. So imagine taking a multiple choice question like this one and seeing if there, instead of making it a four way multiple choice, let's see if we can make it eight way and just do a big search for answer options which seem to, uh, seem to confuse the system. So this question says uh, the conditions of the air, the condition of the air outdoors at a certain time of day is known as what? And the correct answer is weather. So Arista gets this right. So let's add in some uh, additional answer options. So these are kind of crazy options. We add in dual, gradient, trench, and add heat. And so no reasonable uh, student would ever pick these options. Um, we've 
pick these options adversarially. So we've deliberately tried and picked options that we know will confuse the system. And indeed, we find just Arista out of the ball, out of its original training will get confused by these things. So this suggests that it's not doing fully the kind of science reasoning we would like. Um, arguably, this is an unfair test because we've deliberately chosen options, chosen options that we know the system fails at. So what happens if we now uh, re-fine tune it on this data set? Uh, we find actually um, largely the system uh, is able to regain, regain most of its original performance uh, and it learns uh, to recognize crazy options. Uh, it may be that in the original training it just never saw uh, examples of uh, crazy options being presented. Um, numerically, we see the scores drop with this um, after, uh, after retraining a little bit. So it goes from 69% overall down to about 59%. Uh, but of course, remember, we're going from four-way to eight-way multiple choices, which is more difficult. And I think the conclusion here is that um, Aristo is not impervious to this kind of attack. And it suggests that it's not, you know, quite the sort of uh, the rich scientist we would like it to be inside. Um, but it can be uh, it can be fooled by uh, some of these patterns to some degree. Um, the third question which we've addressed, which um, is really interesting to me, is whether Aristo is doing more than just uh, glorified pattern matching. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to switch and uh, just show a, a quick demo um, of, uh, of of Aristo on a question which is uh, quite interesting. So. This is the, the kind of live Aristo system. And at the bottom here, I have a question which I wanted to demonstrate. So I'll just read it. And it's quite a difficult question. Um, it's a full, an eighth grade science question. City administrators can encourage energy conservation by lowering parking fees, building larger parking lots, decreasing the cost of gasoline, or lowering the cost of bus and subway fares. So it's a little bit tricky. If you think about it, the right answer is actually the last one, lowering the cost of bus and subway fares uh, on the logic that uh, uh, lower bus fares will be more public ridership, which means less people in cars, which will mean energy conservation. So I give this to Aristo, it chugs away, and it's actually got the right answer, uh, as we would hope. But more interestingly is if I can, if I edit this option, so edit this question, so I'm going to change this going to play around with this and I'm going to change, change this to uh, raising the cost of bus and subway fares and uh, increasing the cost of, cost of gasoline. And if I now ask this question to Aristo again, it's now correctly changed its answer to increasing the cost of gasoline. So I flipped the polarity on a couple of answer options that changes what the correct answer should be. And Aristo appears to have responded appropriately. Um, I could do another edit. So instead of encourage energy conservation, let's ask about uh, uh, discouraging energy conservation. I'm going to ask this question again. So now, of course, discouraging the energy conservation, the right answer should be switched back to number four, raising the cost of bus and subway fares. And indeed, Aristo switches its answer back. So. This is kind of remarkable that the system's not just uh, um, kind of glorified matching against text, but it seems to be sensitive to some of these uh, semantic nuances in the question. Um, so I'm going to just go back to my presentation now. And the interesting question is, okay, so I showed you an anecdote uh, of this example. Uh, was it just lucky or is it systematic? And so what we've done is to do a, a, a number of systematic probes to see uh, the degree to which Aristo has some of these semantic skills we would like. Um, so let's think in terms of um, a scorecard for Aristo and we're going to probe several semantic skills here, negation, conjunction and polarity and so on to see how well does Aristo know how to handle these different phenomena. So first for negation, how do we test this? Well, we're going to give it a slightly different setup. We're going to give a context. Instead of retrieve sentences, we'll give a fictitious context like this. Alan is small, Alan is tall, and so on. And then we're going to ask, which of the following is not tall? Alan, Bob, Charlie, or David? Uh, David is the uh, correct uh, 
the correct answer here. Uh, and when we give this question to Aristo, uh, we find, and this is, I should add, this is zero shots. So there's no fine tuning on this data set. We just give Aristo exactly as we run it on the science questions. We find, uh, surprisingly, Aristo gets 94% on this. Um, so this is quite remarkable. It seems to have some uh, pretty strong knowledge of the semantics of negation. And we see this in our science questions as well. If we add the word not in some of the multiple choice questions, almost always uh, Aristo correctly switches its answer appropriately based on that edit. So we'll give, the, we'll give Aristo, uh, using the standard rubric, an A. Uh, nice work here. Um, how might we test conjunction? Well, we can do a similar thing. We can give a set of synthetic examples like this. Uh, again, we'll give a context with some uh, properties of people and ask which of the following is big and blue? Is it Alan, Bob, Charlie, which is the correct answer, or David? So Charlie here is the correct answer. Again, giving this zero shot to the system, uh, the system gets no training on this data set. We find Aristo gets 98% uh, on this data set. Uh, as we add more conjunctions, it gets 95 down to 80%. And if we add in negation as well, amazingly, the scores still stay up in uh, 75%. Uh, and just to give you an example of four conjuncts and a negation, uh, here's an example here. We have this rather long context, and we ask the question, which of the following is old and red and light and big and not short? And the answer is complex to work out here. I think I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. But you can see here, this is a fairly uh, uh, complex Boolean combination to, to work out. And Aristo is scoring 75% of this without any explicit training on Boolean reasoning and negation. Um, so we'll give uh, Aristo a B plus here. Uh, for polarity, the examples here uh, are similar to the one I showed in the demo earlier where I flip uh, a qualitative relationship from greater than to less than. Uh, to test this, we're going to give a, a science context here. So here I give a context, sound has a slower speed at lower temperatures. And I'm going to ask, if Jim turns the thermostat down in his room for a while listening to music, what will happen to the speed of sound waves? The correct answer is they will slow down. So this is applying a science principle in a context. And we want Aristo not only to get this question right, but also if we flip the question, so we're gonna change in this case down to up, now the answer option should change from slow down to speed up. So we have pairs of questions like this and to score a point, it has to get both the original and a flipped version of this uh, correct. Now we happen to have a large data set that we built of this kind of uh, polarity pairs. And again, when we test Aristo, it gets about 67% on this. Uh, again, a default would be 25%. And again, this is quite remarkable. It suggests that it has some semantic knowledge in the language models about some of the polarities and polarity inversion here. So we'll give it a D plus. And we know, again, this is zero shot. We, don't, we know also if we fine tune on this data set, it can get scores up in the high 90s. Uh, but again, this is Aristo completely out of the box. Um, I'll skip describing the other uh, examples, except just to mention counting at the end. Uh, we gave some of the Babby counting problems to Risto. They're a little bit weird. Um, uh, they look like this. Daniel picked up the football. Daniel dropped the football. Daniel got the milk. How many objects is Daniel holding? Zero, one, two, or three. One's the correct answer. Uh, Aristo actually does terribly at this. He gets 6%. Um, it has no notion of being able to track and count objects like this. Uh, there was no data, uh, data like this in the original uh, training examples, and so it does, uh, does poorly on this. So let me just delve a little bit into where Aristo fails. So Aristo is getting 90%, which is great, um, but that means 10% of the questions it's getting wrong. So is there any um, systematic uh, uh, pattern to uh, 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 how Aristo is failing. Um, and actually, uh, before I do that, let me just um, uh, glance again at the chat window. There's a couple of other questions that appeared. Um, why do we perform ways worse from fourth grade compared to eighth grade? I think uh, that's true. I think the, eight, the fourth grade was like 89% uh, rather than 91. Um, I think the numbers are not 
um, not hugely significant, uh, so they're within uh, experimental error. Um, there is one interesting feature of fourth grades uh, when we've looked at this in a little bit more detail is that fourth grade questions tend to be more kind of common sensey and less sciencey. So although they may be easier for a person, uh, arguably there are aspects about fourth grade questions that are sometimes actually more difficult to eighth grade. For instance, uh, one of our favorite fourth grade questions were asked about roller skating races on grass versus on gravel. Um, uh, a question which requires a fairly vivid envisionment of fourth grade to, of, of the world, um, which is easy for a fourth grader, but pretty difficult for a machine. Um, so arguably, uh, fourth grade questions, although easy for p people, are not uh, uh, necessarily easier for a machine. A separate question was for polarity, the baseline would be 25% or 50%. So here the, the baseline would be 25%. So those questions were two-way multiple choice, but you have to get two of them right to get a point. So 50% uh, in each of those gives a 25% uh, baseline. Um, uh, another question re regarding counting, could it help to fine tune on, on the drop data set? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we know from other work, um, language models are not inherently incapable of counting. Uh, and there's been, there's been some very interesting uh, uh, demonstrations of that, particularly on the drop data set. Um, I'm sure if we fine tuned on the drop data set, it could ace the uh, counting problem. Uh, as I say, our goal here was to probe what semantic skills Aristo had learned in the process of uh, its uh, natural fine tuning on science questions. Uh, so thank you guys, uh, awesome questions. Um, so let me continue at this point, and I'm going to just delve into where Aristo fails. So um, uh, is there any systematicity in where Aristo is going wrong? So the answer is there is actually a lot of uh, systematic uh, behavior in its failures. Uh, and in particular, as I mentioned, um, Aristo has an IR step. We can look at what it retrieved and ask, um, in particular, um, if it got a question wrong, did it just get the wrong information? Is it a failure of knowledge? Or did it get the right knowledge and then just couldn't reason its way or, or do some neural version of reasoning to the right answer? So we looked at this. We looked at 30, did a case study on 30 failures. We found in only four cases, uh, there was good retrieved support for the correct answer. So this is actually quite surprising. What it means is if the information retrieval step produces good knowledge in support of the correct answer. Aristo almost always gets the right answer here. There were just a few cases where the system still got, got confused even when the IR was correct. And I'll give an example of, of that in a second. Um, there was one case where actually it retrieved good support for the incorrect answer. Um, the majority of cases though, um, there simply wasn't any retrieved uh, knowledge that was uh, relevant for the right answer. And um, you could say that's a failure of the IR step. It's more likely because of the nature of the questions. And again, I'll illustrate those in a second. And then there were eight questions we looked at, eight failures we looked at where the questions were more reading comprehension, um, less about applying general science principles to a problem and more about careful understanding uh, where retrieval isn't gonna help. And I'll mention those. So first of all, these questions where the system probably should have got it right. So here's an example of those. Uh, which is the best unit to measure distances between Earth and other solar systems in the universe? Um, the correct answer is light years. Uh, Aristo chose astronomical units. It did retrieve support for the right answer here. Distance between Earth and the stars is often measured in terms of light years, but it conf got confused by uh, this information it retrieved for the incorrect answer. In general, distances in the solar system are measured in astronomical, astronomical units. So there's kind of a subtlety here. Are we talking about distances between solar systems or within solar systems? Uh, and it's uh, decided the question's asking about within a particular solar system. I think uh, if I remember my physics and astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Um, so it's kind of a subtle error. Aristo made a mistake here. Um, arguably a person might get confused with this as well. So it's not a, a totally terrible error. 
Uh, and as I say, these were the minority of cases. Um, most cases where it retrieved supporting evidence, it was able to get the right answer. Here's a quick look at a question where there was support for the incorrect answer. Which of these objects will most likely float in water? Uh, it picked a rubber ball, although the answer is tennis ball. And in fact, there's a lot of statements in the corpus that say rubber balls float. Um, the way Aristo is engineered, it's answer, it assesses each answer option independently, uh, and it's not able to do uh, intra-answer option comparisons. And so it found evidence for both. I guess it decided the rubber ball evidence was stronger, um, but it's not able to do the kind of inter-option inter comparison, which led to this failure. Uh, more interestingly, here's some questions where it wasn't able to find uh, support for the correct answer and made a mistake. So this question here essentially asks, what's the difference between an eagle and a pelican? The correct answer is their method of catching food. Instead, it picked their method of reproduction. Now, there's nothing in our corpus that explicitly compares eagle and pelicans. Rather, a person answering this question would do some kind of question decomposition here, would say, okay, you know, tell me about eagles, tell me about pelicans, let's compare those facts and come up with an answer. Uh, Aristo doesn't have any built-in decomposition methods like that, and so it's unable to, to do that kind of decomposition to get the relevant knowledge. And even if it did, it's not clear whether it would be able to put that knowledge together. And another example in related sense is the example I showed at the beginning, how the particles in a block of iron affected when the block is melted. Um, it should have picked the particles move more rapidly. Now we know in our corpus, there's statements that says high temperatures cause particles to move rapidly and melting is a result of higher temperatures. Um, but because that pivoting term temperature is not melted, mentioned in the question here, the IR step fails to retrieve that relevant bits of information. And even if it did, it's not clear that Arista would be able to combine that information. So this is a, a good example of a multi hot problem. Um, it also uh, struggled with reading comprehension questions. Uh, so in this question, uh, there's a, an experiment described and the question is, what is the independent variable? Uh, so here, no amount of information retrieval is gonna help. And so uh, it gets this one wrong. And then there are a few questions like this one uh, about sentiment. Which statement is an opinion? Uh, it thinks plants require sunlight is the correct answer, rather than many plants are beautiful. Again, IR is unlikely to help here. And this requires, again, some uh, recognition that this is a different style of question uh, than the standard apply a science principle. Um, and there was a question that came up. Uh, on the decomposition answer uh, example, shouldn't tuple inference help? Uh, that's a great, great question. And in fact, tuple inference does very well on those kind of decomposition questions. However, it seems to struggle with some of the more basic questions. So the net overall effect is the language models outperform tuple inference. Um, the two together uh, have a slight benefit. Uh, but yes, that kind of tuple inference decomposition is uh, exactly uh, the, the kind of thing it was designed for. And I'll finally just mention one question, which I think is really interesting that Aristo gets wrong, about how long does it take for the moon to complete one revolution around the Earth? The correct answer is 30 days. Aristo picks 365 days. And in fact, it retrieves a lot of evidence for the 30-day answer. It takes the moon about 27.3 days to evolve, revolve around the Earth, 27.3, 29.5, and so on. However, the language models have no recognition that 27.3 is close to 30 days. And so it gets, a, it gets the answer wrong here. It's confused by retrieval talking about uh, Earth rotating around, uh, around the sun. Uh, so the, again, this is an interesting example of uh, failure. So I think the net conclusion here is that although Aristo is doing well, uh, there are various families of questions which still uh, completely stump it. And what I want to do uh, in this final section now is to talk about steps forward that we're taking to address some of these more challenging questions that take us towards, I think, the, the, the bigger kind of AI dream of systems that can really understand science and reason about us. So first, this question of question decomposition. Um, as I, here's another example. What virus structure is similar in function to a cell membrane? The IR that's retrieved here is largely junk. There's nothing about the function of the cell membrane or the virus structure here. Instead, 
we'd like the system as a person would to apply some sort of problem solving method. We'll take this question, we'll ask, well, uh, let's answer this sub question. What's the function of a cell membrane? Maybe a, a simple neural system can tell you a membrane surrounds and protects. What then we'll ask what parts of the virus surrounds and protects it. So the answer is the protein shell and answer that question. So we now have an active project uh, looking at this. Uh, we have descriptions of it in EMNLP 2019 on GAP-QA and uh, there's actually a lot of work on these complex questions. Uh, there's several data sets, uh, complex web question data sets, uh, the question driven, meaning representation and so on. And this is an attempt to layer some kind of uh, structure around the otherwise opaque uh, neural reasoning that was going on previously. So this I think is a really exciting direction. Secondly, in terms of multi-hop reasoning, uh, some questions like this one uh, are difficult to answer just in a single step. So what conducts electricity? Pursuit of armor. So this is such an obscure question that uh, IR is unlikely to retrieve anything useful. If we do IR, we find things about uh, conductivity and resistivity and metal. Uh, to really answer this, we need to now do further IR and say, hey, well, how do these terms relate perhaps to the answer option and do a second retrieval step? And then are there paths through these sequence of retrievals that seem like a, a, va a valid chain of reasoning? Uh, clearly just hopping from sentence to se sentence uh, doesn't necessarily give a valid chain of inference. Um, a valid chain might be suits of armor uh, are made of metal, metals conduct electrical currents. So this is a good chain suggesting suits of armor conduct electricity. Um, we don't want to recognize things like, you know, resist, if you resist arrest, suits can be filed and resist, resistivity and conductivity are related. Uh, this doesn't imply suits of armor conducts electricity. And so we'd like to uh, have um, uh, some way of training the system to recognize valid and invalid chains of reasoning. Uh, the third area we're pushing quite hard on is about modeling world states. Um, so a lot of science is about processes and when people think about processes, we create a kind of mental picture of the world uh, and how it changes uh, during a process. Uh, and in a way, this is the heart of understanding. And if we really want to claim a neural system or Aristo really understands science, it should have some of this understand, some of this envisionment capability as well. So here's a passage about photosynthesis. As I read it, um, I might read roots absorb water from the soil. I create this mental picture in my head. Okay, there's a plant, there's some roots, they're in the soil, and there's some water and it's traveling up into the roots. And then the water flows to the leaf in my mental picture, the water flows to the leaf and so on. And so I, create this uh, uh, mental picture uh, of the world that allows me to imagine what's going on and how the, uh, uh, how the world changes from step to step. Um, and now if I ask a question like, where is the sugar created? I can easily say, sure, the sugar is created in the leaf because that's where all the ingredients are converging. Now, if we give this system to a, a typical neural question answering system, it has no idea. So we give it to BIDAF, it says lights, water, CO2. Um, the system has no idea even that there's a sequence of events. So we're doing some uh, new work now related to trying to create explicit uh, representations of the states. So we'll create a state from the first step and then the state and the next action creates a new step and a new step and a new step and so on. So uh, as a result we can answer questions like where is the sugar created by looking at this envisionment of the world. Uh, we have a uh, a set of two data sets we've created called ProPara, a more recently open PI, and ProStruct and ProCalls are two models that do this. Uh, so this again is trying to push out a deeper notion of machine understanding of the kinds that Paul Allen was after at the beginning. And finally, there's this really interesting question about whether we can do systematic reasoning with neural systems. Uh, for example, um, let's consider this dialogue. Suppose I ask, can you pick up a penny with a magnet? Aristo says yes. Okay, now we'd like to ask, well, why is that? And have the system give back a reasoned answer to the question. Um, for example, pennies are made of metal, metals are magnetic. 
Um, now, suppose I don't like that chain of reasoning. Suppose I decide actually there's an error. I'd like to be able to argue back and say, well, actually not all metals are magnetic. Uh, copper is not magnetic, try again. And now the system should be able to absorb what I've told it and re re redo its reasoning. And it says, for instance, pennies are made of copper. Coppers are not magnetic and gives the right answer. So to support this kind of uh, reasoned explanation and this kind of uh, instructional dialogue, the neural system needs to be more than just giving it a black box answer. It needs to be reasoning in a systematic way. And so can we train a model to do this kind of systematic reasoning, perhaps not using a formal representation, but using language? So if you wanted to do this, how might you train a system? Well, we need some training examples and they might look something like this. So here's one training example. We're gonna tell the system, metals are magnetic, nails are made of metal. Is it true that nails are magnetic? And the label we want the system to predict is true. And just to make sure it's not just using its pre-trained background knowledge, we also want it to behave differently under this, these conditions. So we're going to tell it metals are not magnetic. So this is a counterfactual. Nails are made of metal. Is it true that nails are magnetic? We want the system to give the answer false. Uh, so can we create a whole bunch of examples of this kind of systematic reasoning uh, and have the system learn to answer questions in this way? So we've created a system called Rule Taker, which attempts to do this. Um, the way we do this is we uh, start with a, uh, um, uh, we generate a, uh, a theory in formal logic, uh, again, about a fictitious scenario with people and attributes. Uh, and then we convert it into a templated natural language. So it consists of a set of facts, Alan is blue and so on, a set of rules. And now we're going to ask a question against this natural language theory, uh, is Bob green or not? Uh, and what's the label? Is it true or false? Well, we can assign a label because we have the formal equivalent of this theory. We can give it to a re formal reasoner and get an answer. So here the answer should be true. And if you look at the natural language, you can see how that's the case. Bob is big. The rules say big people are rough. Another rule says rough people are green and therefore Bob is green. So all this together constitutes one training example. So let's synthesize thousands of these, train a system, and see if we can train it to not kind of induce rules from examples, but learn to respond uh, to a set of rules that are given explicitly at runtime and do systematic reasoning. And so I'm going to switch again now and just give a quick demo of this. Um, and this is our um, uh, rule taker system. Uh, and this again provides uh, some quite interesting examples. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give some rules to uh, to rule taker. So I'm going to type in, um, let's say, uh, metals conduct electricity. And we'll say, uh, um, let's see, iron is a metal and uh, insulators do not conduct electricity. And uh, now we'll say uh, nails are made of iron. Now, can it reason with these rules and give the right answer if I ask, is it true that nails conduct electricity? So I'm gonna submit this and it comes back with the answer true. Now suppose I change this, let's say nails are made of plastic and I'll say plastic is an insulator. Now if I resubmit this query, we find rule taker has now changed its answer uh, reacting to the change facts and rules. Uh, and similarly, I can add in a counterfactual fact. So let's say um, counterfactually plastic is a metal, although it's not really. And now from this reasoning, the system should reason. Nails are made of plastic, which is the metal, which conducts electricity. Again, if I give this example, now rule taker has returned the, the answer true. So this is an illustration that we can uh, surprisingly train neural systems, not just to answer questions, but reason in a systematic way uh, using a set of rules that we present at. 
So I'm just going to go back to my um, original slideshow here. And I'll just open the chat. I'm sorry, excuse me, jumping around with questions. There's another question which somebody asked about modeling states. Have we considered uh, an exp injecting an explicit memory within language models? Um, so uh, yes, that's exactly the way our models do that. Um, the earlier, sorry, this is going back to about modeling states. Our earlier systems uh, did create a model of states uh, using uh, a special neural, neural architecture. Our new work is working with transformers to include uh, memory blocks, uh, in, indeed similar to uh, Jonathan Barron's recent work with uh, neural uh, systems with memory blocks. And I think that's exactly the, the right way to go. Um, just to uh, uh, finish off this, uh, this uh, description about reasoning with rules, um, uh, so in the examples I gave, um, I had to give a fully contained theory, um, but we know from uh, uh, experiments with language models that actually language models contain a lot of pre-trained uh, background knowledge. So is it possible to have language models reason not just with explicit rules, but combining some of its implicit knowledge that uh, it already has? So this is the... Uh, um, uh, one of the most recent experiments we've done, which is really exciting. So um, I'll illustrate it with this example here. So we're going to tell the system um, some general rules. Mammals have belly buttons. Fish do not have belly buttons. A whale is a mammal. And we're going to ask, does a whale have a belly, have a belly button? So we know we can train a neural system to do this kind of reasoning. This is what rule taker does. Now, suppose we withheld the fact a whale is a mammal. What we'd like the system to do is to say, okay, I have some of the knowledge, but actually I already know from my pre-training that a whale is a mammal. And so I should be able to combine that basic knowledge with the uh, knowledge I've told it and come up with the right answer. And then if we do these kind of experiments, uh, we also should compare with just uh, a prior knowledge, you know, does it already, did it already know this? What would the prior be? And so we trained a system to do this by using a blend of training data. Uh, we use a 20 question data set for basic question answering. Uh, we synthesize a bunch of training examples like this where we withhold some of the facts that we'd like it to learn, or we'd like it to use that we expect to have in its background knowledge. And then we train it on general rule reasoning using our rule taker data set. And what we find is um, uh, on we give questions with the full knowledge. It does almost perfectly, uh, as, uh, as we've found out. Um, if we just look at its prior knowledge about the questions we give it, it does 65%. Uh, so it does have some prior knowledge about some of these tricky questions we're going to provide. Um, but we do find uh, when we give partial knowledge, the scores go up to 89%. So this provides some uh, fairly strong evidence that the system is not just reasoning with the rules we give it, but also some of its background knowledge. And we could ask, okay, it's got 89%, it's not 100%, you know, what accounts for this 11% gap? Uh, so we probed some of the 11% of questions that fail. So uh, let's, for example, suggest, uh, let's uh, imagine this example failed. Um, the system gave the wrong answer. Uh, we wanted it to use its knowledge that we hoped it had, that a whale is a mammal, but did it actually have that pre-trained knowledge? Well, we can explicitly probe for it by asking the question answering system ex explicitly, is a whale a mammal? And what we find in almost every case where the system fails the complex question, it was because it actually had the wrong uh, prior belief about some of these implicit facts that we needed to, that it needed to use. Or in other words, if the implicit knowledge uh, its implicit beliefs about the world were correct. It gets the right answer 99.7% of the time. So this is a great example that the system appears to be reasoning, reasoning systematically, combining its implicit and explicit knowledge. So let me just finish at this point uh, uh, to try and summarize the main points here. Arisa has had surprising, surprising success. And I think one thing that language models have shown is that Structure is not essential for many tasks that uh, kind of old folk like me used to think was essential. 
Uh, and I've also shown the language models are doing way more than just pattern matching. There's some amazing skills that these language models have. Um, but I've also shown there's uh, a bunch of types of questions uh, that these um, language models still struggle with. Uh, and so what do we need going forward? Uh, I would posit we want to reintroduce some notion of rational inference if we're ever going to be able to understand what our machines are doing and be able to have a dialogue with them and be able to correct them, but perhaps not using formal, uh, formal reasoning as we've been, uh, uh, we've thought in the past, but using more language-like representations. And I've illustrated several steps uh, that we've been taking in that direction. And at this point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Peter. And right on time too. Um, I think because, do you have a, a, a um, a one-on-one -on -one right now? Um, no, I have some extra time. I'm happy to stay on the line and answer further questions if necessary. Yeah, so does anyone have any questions? Feel free to uh, uh, raise their hand. Um, I asked this in the chat, uh, but I can I can just say it again. So when you did that uh, example with the energy conservation, there were actually multiple answers at the end uh, that were correct. And when you looked at the confidences, actually a few of them were, were pretty low, you know, in the 10% range, while the, the correct one was, I think, above 50%. So could you speak a little bit more about confidence cal calibration? I know you mentioned a little bit about multi-answer being bad for Aristo, but I think that seems like a, another frontier in this type of thing where there are multiple answers and you really have to separate the right from the wrong. Uh, and I think the way we do these hierarchical softmaxes is, is sort of does a disservice in this. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, we um, we calibrated the confidence, confidences to try and have the system give the uh, uh, pick the right answer, um, but the confidences don't offer, I think, a reasonable probabilistic. Uh, uh, evidence about what the what the right answer is, and particularly as you, you you'll notice quite quickly with language models, uh, people who play around with uh, transformers, and in fact our rule taker system, confidence are almost always like 99.9 percent .9 or 0.1 percent because of course it's multiplying vast numbers of uh, small numbers together. Um, I think there is a huge potential to have neural systems not just predict answers, but predict answers with a calibrated degree of confidence. Uh, um, we've toyed around, so we, we illustrated training um, a rule taker using formal logic. It'd be very interesting to train uh, a, a neural system using maybe a Bayesian logic, where the goal is not just to get the right answer, but to predict a confidence that's in line with the Bayesian prediction. Um, so I guess the short answer is, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, the confidences do illustrate there's something amiss in the learner. Uh, I do think there's a, a whole frontier there in trying to get neural systems to handle confidences and maybe probabilities uh, uh, more effectively. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Wolf. Yes, Paul. I have a question. First of all, uh, great talk. Thank you very much, and congratulations on, a, on an amazing 93% uh, score. Uh, very impressive. So my question relates to uh, providing evidence that might be uh, readable by, by humans. So you have confidence scores. Uh, can you provide justifications that, that gives us confidence in those confidence scores? I know this is not easy when you have neural networks uh, and ensembles. Um, yeah, but I'm sure you've given it some thought, and uh, you know that might be very interesting to kind of be able to read the rationale the system might have behind. It. Right. So, so the nearest thing that we give in terms of rationale are the uh, the information retrieval results, um, and sometimes uh, they're they're not an ideal summary of. Uh, well, first of all, they don't necessarily reflect what the system did. And typically, you know, we retrieve 10 sentences, maybe just one of those will be uh, relevant or particularly um, informative to the, to the question. Um, so um, from a practical point of view, uh, the system 
will offer something to the user, um, but it's, um, it's a poor approximation of the evidence it used. Um, and it also doesn't reflect the reasoning uh, that went in inside. And of course, if the system's doing some heavily weighted sum of evidence over the uh, sentences that were re retrieved, it's hard to explain that. Uh, our goal with um, Rule Taker is to try to change the way that the system is arriving at the answer to one that is more systematic based on the information that's retrieved. Um, so what we'd like to do is um, uh, instead of, so I showed Rule Taker uh, where we gave some synthetic examples of, or, or toy examples of rules. What we'd like is the system to take the information retrieval results uh, and then come up with an answer uh, where um, we know it's did some kind of systematic reasoning over those facts. And we found uh, with Rule Taker, it is possible to more accurately pinpoint which of the uh, rules it actually used in the, um, in the reasoning it apparently did uh, by doing ablations. You can do leave one out, testing, find which rules actually make a difference and highlight those in an explanation. All right, um, it looks like there are no more speakers or no more questions. So uh, with that, I would like to thank you for the talk, Peter. Great, um, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for the awesome questions uh, uh, on the way through as well. Uh, it's uh, great to have some interaction uh, um, even at a distance. Absolutely. All right, uh, I'll stop recording now. And uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll stop the meeting. All right, thanks, and I'll see, see you soon.